Yeah, there still are some cash only businesses. Every time I see one, I'm always like, why are you doing cash only? Is there something uh, going on back there? But uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's less and less, I feel like. I mean, I certainly don't have near as much cash in my wallet as I once did. Hey, welcome to PayPod, where we bring you conversations with the trailblazers shaping the future of payments and fintech. My name is Kevin Rosenquist. Thanks for listening. Today, I'm talking with Keith Reardon, the co-founder of Commonwealth Consulting Group, a financial services firm specializing in payment processing solutions. They offer a wide range of services aimed at helping businesses manage their payment needs more effectively. How are they different? Instead of being a faceless payment processor, cold calling and sending out spam, they sit down with clients and provide actual service, ensuring that every business they work with is getting exactly what they need. Novel concept, huh? We had a great conversation about payments, industry trends, and how cash is still very relevant. Joining me now, Keith Reardon. You spent a year and change as a high school chemistry teacher, switched to be a finan- switched to being a financial advisor, then founded Commonwealth Consulting Group, a payments company in 2010. I've, I've heard people say before that being a founder is one of the hardest things they've ever done. Is it harder or easier than teaching science to high school kids? <laughs> I would say they're equally as, uh, as challenging. Um, but I knew I wasn't going to be in, uh, education for, for that long. Okay. Um, when I, when I got done with school, I took a year off. I was planning to go to medical school, but, um, at some point during the aspect of teaching, I enjoyed making a paycheck and decided that going to medical school for four years and then a residency and a fellowship wasn't for me. So. Um, just had my resume up, got into the financial services industry kind of by accident. And then through that, I met my business partner. And during the recession is when we started Commonwealth Consulting Group. Cool. Well, I, could I guess it, it could have gone worse. You could have gone the Breaking Bad route and went from teaching chemistry to cooking math. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, well, that's cool. So were you always, were you always interested in finance or is that something that just sort of kind of happened? It kind of just happened. Um, I had my resume out there. I got, um, recruited by a lot of, uh, very large, well-known financial institutions. And the reason they liked my resume was that I had a degree in STEM and I was teaching. So they knew that I could take a complex subject matter and, uh, I always joke around, break it down into Lego terms. Lego terms, yeah. Well, we just talked about our kids, so I guess that makes sense that you say Lego terms, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a good way to put it. And uh, so so Commonwealth Consulting Group, or CCG, you, you guys have a lot of offerings from, from, uh, from payment processing to ATMs to gift cards and loyalty cards. What is there one particular thing that's your bread and butter, or do you kind of just spread it out amongst different things in the payments? About 65% of our revenues are through payments, merchant services, and then gift and loyalty is just something that comes along with merchant services. And then about 35% of our revenues is made up of ATMs. Um, We have a bunch of financial institutions that we do a lot of work with. And about five years or so ago, one of the financial institutions told us we needed to put an ATM at this location. And we were like, no, we're all set. They kept saying, no, you need to put an ATM at this location. And we were like, okay, we'll figure it out. And it was one of the greatest things that we did because um, we always knew about that side of the business, but you can only be good at so many things. Sure. Um, you don't want to spread but, yourself too thin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But overall, um, you know, we've started a whole ATM division and that's growing uh, really well, you know, with the merch and services side. And it's just been kind of a good marriage between our merchants that you need both services from us. And it also allows us to focus on some cash only establishments, whether it's, you know, your local diner or your barber shop or, you know, whatever it may be where it makes sense for an ATM to be present. People think cash is dead, but it is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There still are some cash only businesses. Every time I see one, I'm always like, why are you doing cash only? Is there something uh, going on back there? But uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's less and less. I feel like, I mean, I certainly don't have near as much cash in my wallet as I once did. Yeah. But we're seeing in Massachusetts and the Northeast, we're seeing a big uptick in the amount of cash. 
Um, specifically, I yeah. think it's due to a lot of your smaller mom and pop businesses that are converting to either surcharging or cash discounting, um, depending on you know what state they're in and whether they can do surcharging or not. So with that, there's been a big increase in the amount of cash that businesses are taking in due to them having some type of surcharging or cash discounting program. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, you're right about like the fees. I mean, obviously small businesses with, 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 uh, with credit card fees and stuff like that. If you're not, if you're not supplementing that through a surcharge or through cash discount, I mean, you're, 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 you're spending a lot more, you're spending a lot of money. I mean, I've, I've managed some business oh, yeah. and you know, holy cow, like we spent a lot on credit card charges. Yeah. And merchants continually get frustrated, frustrated with us, but it's not us that are, you know, making interchange rates. Right. The banks have a monopoly on both sides. They're creating the interchange rates that businesses pay to accept cards. And then they're charging their cardholders interest rates if they're not paying their balance off at the end of every month. And so, you know, the, the issuing card brands really control everything and we just have to kind of follow the rules and, you know, then you have all the network guidelines with Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and Amex. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I noticed you work with POS systems too. Uh, I'm curious, let me give you a scenario. So if I'm a restaurant owner and I use Aloha for my point of sale, I saw you guys integrate with Aloha. What, what does CCG provide me on top of what I already get from the processing that Aloha has? So there's a lot of point of sale systems that are out there that are similar to Aloha where they're, they have sort of a franchisee model where there's a, there's an Aloha office in your particular region and then they have their payment processing and typically they're doing things at much higher costs than what the marketplaces because they know they have you hooked you're already on that particular system and so they kind of upcharge a little bit on the merchant services fees so we've worked with a lot of software development agencies so that we can create integrations to various systems that have an open api and so it allows more autonomy for that particular business owner if they want to stay on that particular point of sale system they could work with us. They could work with their current vendor. They can now work with any other vendor. We really don't like any merchant to have to be forced into working with us. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't do contracts. We don't do termination fees. We're month to month with all of our customers because we feel that we need to be delivering great products and service continually, or you should be free to leave. And it's really not the standard within our industry. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing more and more software companies getting into the payment space and locking down their system so that they're, you can only use them for payments. And I feel that that's a massive disservice to the, the merchant because it just doesn't give them the flexibility to shop their vendors and make sure that they're getting, you know, what's the best possible cost structure for their particular business. Yeah, that's interesting. Why do you think, I mean, is it just greed and, and just not wanting to let go of people? Why do you lock down, why would someone lock down their system? I mean, I feel like people would be more receptive to, uh, you know, a platform that has a little more openness to it and not being so locked down. It's greed for the most yeah. part. They want to control the monthly SaaS fee as well as the merchant services revenue. They'll tell you that the reason they do it is because of technical support phone calls and somebody's calling and complaining about the merchant services and they don't know who that merchant services rep is. So it streamlines the point of sale systems, uh, tech support. But if you have a good relationship with your merchant, your merchant knows, okay, if it's a point of sale system problem, I'm going to call the POS software company. If it's a credit card, debit card related issue, I'm going to call my merchant services provider. Mm -hmm. So it, it really just comes down to relationships and just making sure that you have a good relationship with your merchant and you're educating them. You know, so many businesses out there do tiered pricing or flat rate pricing which is easy to sell, but it's just not in the merchant's best interest. They should be getting the wholesale rates from interchange based on the Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and Amex tables that change every April and every October. 
and then have some type of basis point and transaction fee markup on top of that because then they're getting the best possible cost structure and they're able to hit the best interchange categories for their business, whether they're a restaurant or a school or business to business, which is really critical to make sure that they're on an interchange pass-through structure just due to level two and level three processing rates, which can lower a B2B company's costs by upwards of a whole percentage point simply by making sure that they're processing their cards properly on the interchange tables. I wonder if that if I wonder if that'll change more because I feel like more and more people are hesitant on long-term contracts and they're t- hesitant to be locked in, especially with, you know, you see a lot of things even commercials for cell phones and everything it's like no 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 long-term contracts anymore. I wonder if you'll see more people going, "Oh, okay, yeah, I don't need to be locked into a contract and it'll force businesses to change." I hope so. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, but it's, I don't see it in the industry uh, yeah. right now. It's been this way for 15, 20 years since we've been doing stuff within the industry. And it really hasn't changed much with our competition. What did you see in the payments industry that made you want to get into it? So when we were in the financial services industry, we were working with business owners and CFOs and other C-suite executives at companies doing personal wealth management. And then during the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis, they kept having us look at their profit and loss statements to try to figure out ways to reduce their operating costs so that they could stay in business. And what we kept seeing was that they were spending a lot of money to take money in. And we had no concept of that. Like, why are you spending thousands of dollars a month to take payments? It was just so foreign to us. We always assumed that it was Visa that did everything. Right. So when we really peeled the onion back and looked at the merchant services industry, we might buddy and I, who's my business partner, just kind of had an epiphany and we're like, I think we could just do this. And so we went to one of these businesses and we said, Hey, don't cancel anything with your current vendor, but here's what we've done. Here's the agreements that we put into place with the acquiring slash sponsor banks and various networks, TSIS, first data, et cetera. I think that we can do this and I think we can do it better, but we don't know. However, you're begging us to help you on your operating costs. So let's just give it a go. Yeah, and that's yeah, what we what did. What do you got to lose? Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. And so that's what we did. Yeah. And 30 days later, we went back to this client and we saved them more money than we thought we were going to. And we increased the time efficiencies greatly. They were doing everything manually. We completely automated their sales process oh. and how payments were processed. We eliminated their AR. They didn't have any AR anymore except for outstanding debt prior to when we got there because now everything was automated. So as soon as the product shipped, boom, the account was billed either by credit card, debit card, or ACH. So they were never really needing to send out invoices anymore. And that was revolutionary for them and it really helped them to create better cash flow. And then they were able to go to their their lenders and refinance all of their debt because they had more predictable cash flow. So they look a lot better to a lending uh, institution. And then we told the CFO and the CEO of this business, tell everybody, you know, Um, and that's, that's how we started. That's how we grew. Um, And then we formed some really good relationships with some CFOs and controllers. And they're a very uh, connected group. There's so many CFO and controller groups on LinkedIn and various other platforms, and they all talk and they ask about various vendor relationships and vendor issues that they might be having. And we kept getting more and more referrals. And then we started going up market, working with you know businesses doing several hundred million a year in revenues to then businesses doing billions of dollars a year in revenue. And from there, that's how our pro- our products and services really expanded. We started working with clients that were using you know, U.S. dollars and Canadian dollars. Right. And now we needed to figure out how to settle funds in Canadian dollars as well as U.S. dollars. Once we figured that out, now we needed to figure out how to deal with all the currency exchange between those two currencies if they needed to move money from their Canadian accounts to their U.S. accounts. 
And we really tried to figure out ways that we could be better and less, uh, more cost effective than their current financial institution that was doing their currency trading for them. And it's, I think without having that financial services background, we wouldn't have been able to, to do what we have done and really take that relationship based selling and bring it into what is really traditionally a transactional based selling model. People aren't used to us coming in and really sitting down and trying to understand their business, how they operate, what they do, so that we can come back to that, not just with ways to save money, but how to eliminate time spent, whether it's integrating into their Oracle or SAP or Salesforce or whatever ERP they're using, all the way down to QuickBooks, so that everything is automated, everything is easy, they don't have multiple systems that they need to log into, and they're getting a cost-effective payment processing solution that's at the wholesale rates for whatever the service is, whether it's credit cards, whether it's ACH, whether it's, it doesn't matter. We're very transparent and we show them, here's what our cost is and here's what our markup is. And if you're not okay with that, you're free to leave. Yeah, that's interesting too, because I remember being in business and I mean, I would get calls and emails all the time from payment processing companies. And it wasn't a, there was no personal touch to it. It was just generic, you know, call center calls kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and so, yeah, yeah I suppose you're right. That's probably people are like, oh, there's actually like a bit of service here. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it, it, people, CFOs, controllers, and then your smaller businesses where it's just, you know, a, sing, a sole proprietor, they have such a bad taste in their mouth because they get three to four phone calls a day. They got yep. one to two people walking in off the street. Yeah. And we just you. take a different approach. And so a lot of the times the hardest part is getting them to understand that we're not like the other companies yeah. out there that are cold calling. That's really the most challenging part because once we peel the onion back and we have a meeting and we can then provide them with um, some solutions, the sales cycle is relatively simple from there. Does this make sense? Yes or no. And if they say no, we're usually shaking our heads like, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. What's the what's the first thing you look at when you do an audit of a of a potential client? We obviously are gonna if they have a current vendor relationship, we're gonna audit all of the statements for the past few months. Um there's a lot of companies that are really transparent, but there's also a lot of companies that hide the true costs of processing Wait. and merchants aren't going to comb through their statement to really fully understand that. So we want to make sure that A, they're set up with the right merchant category code, B, that they're on a proper pricing structure. And then we're going to have a conversation around what's your sales cycle. Or is it face to face? Is it over the phone? Is it internet? Is it some type of combination of them all? What are you using for an accounting or an ERP system? Who's your financial institution that you're working with? What's your AR like? Do you have a ton of net 60s, net 90s that are just sitting out there, mm -hmm. net 180s that are just sitting out there? Jeez, okay, well, then let's <laughs> talk about that. I mean, you'd be shocked. That's yeah, crazy. There's so many manufacturing <laughs> and industrial companies that just don't get paid. And it's amazing to me when you look at their AR and how long uh, an invoice has been sitting out there. And it's a little bit different if they're doing federal contracts with the military or various government institutions. Like, yeah, that's slow money, but that's good money and you know it's coming. But when it's you know another business similar to yourself and they're not paying you, why are you providing a product or a service? But anyway, mm -hmm. We really just try to have that conversation and just figure out, okay, here's how you're doing it today. Is that the right way? Couldn't, could, it may or may not be, but we're going to go through and really just try to punch holes in that whole process and really figure out ways to make it so that you're able to process payments quicker with less clicks or no clicks at all. And that the accounts receivable department, no matter if it's a one person operation or a 500 person operation that's handling their AR department, they're able to get what they need to reconcile really quickly. And then we talk about price. So we want to come in with some value 
because everybody's going to talk about price. Oh, you're sure. at 50 basis points above cost. We'll do it for 30. Like who cares about that? What is the actual value that you're providing? And that's where I think our integrations into ERP systems, accounting systems from you know QuickBooks and Zero and FreshBooks, because you could just process directly with Intuit Merchant Services. Sure, yeah, that's a, that's what I've done. They're incredibly yeah. expensive, very. And so, if you could work with a, a company like us and still have your QuickBooks, it's and and you're able to still do everything in QuickBooks. Well, that's a win-win for a business because they're used to creating that invoice in QuickBooks and handling everything in QuickBooks. So if we can make that all work and then have the payment processing fully connected and integrated to that in the native way that they're used to doing their business, it just makes it really simple to talk to them about you know why it might make sense for them to work with us versus the native merchant services relationship to that particular accounting or ERP system. Absolutely. With all Basically, the tech- if it's like on an open API, we'll we'll integrate. You'll integrate, yeah, yeah, yeah. With with all the technological technological changes, especially you know in the last couple of years, what are some of the new trends you're seeing in the payments industry overall? Anything stand out? Bigger businesses have always been doing integrations because they have the budgets to do it. But the right. biggest thing that we're seeing is your small businesses, not even your mid-sized businesses, but your small businesses are really looking to automate and integrate. And that is is growing very, very rapidly. And it's really good for those small businesses because if you're an electrician or an HVAC company and it's one owner and then maybe they've got three or four licensed um, electricians or HVAC techs working for them, you know, that's a small operation, but to them, it's their life. It's their livelihood. It's their, it's their blood, sweat, and tears that they've built. But what they're really good at is wiring a house or fixing an electrical problem or dealing with making it hot, hot, making it cold, making it humid, making it not humid. What they're usually not good at is running the business. And so if we can come in and create ways for them to run their business better, more efficiently, without them having to do anything, it's revolutionary to them. It's so many times we'll go into tradespeople's offices, my sales agents, and there'll be mounds of of estimates and invoices, and nothing's been done with them Mm -hmm. because- the only time that the business owner has to do it is seven o'clock at night until they go to bed yeah, because during the day they're doing the work or they're trying to get out and do that estimate and they don't have time to really work on the business because they're always in the business doing their trade. And that that analogy works with so many other small businesses as well. They're really good at at making their product or making their service but not great at running their business and making sure that their profit margins are going to give them the net profit that they need to survive for the long term. And so you're seeing more smaller businesses looking for ways to actually help that side of their business, the actual business side of their business, and they're able to do it because of the technology because it's cheaper. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, because so many plugins have become available that really? used to be out of reach financially for that small business. And now for a nominal, you know, monthly SaaS fee, you're able to basically create all of these um, integrations into that small business accounting type system. Um, you know, with big businesses, a lot of things is just really centralizing everything so that they can just do everything in one platform. So, you know, having it fully integrated into their ERP or their um, CRM so that everything is just done that way. They don't have multiple systems that they're logging into. That's a, a real big thing. Um, and then from a, a technological enhancement, I think one of the, the broad tools and making sure that they're on and working properly have become uh, really big. Um, fraudsters are are really good at stealing people's identity and stealing people's card data and then running phishing attempts on businesses websites or however they might be able to infiltrate their network 
And it's making sure that they have those proper fraud tools and chargeback prevention tools in place. So that I think is another, you know, really big area as well um, that we're seeing a lot more penetration in because businesses are getting hacked so much more frequently. Like, yep. yes, fraudsters are going after the targets and the Walmarts, but they're more so going after that smaller business because they know that target spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to prevent fraud that small business is typically spending zero dollars yeah I and totally it's a agree. lot easier <laughs> to hack that system than it is to to hack some you know one of the big multi-billion dollar corporations yeah the la the last the uh, like day job that i had i i was like hey we should probably upgrade our security ah we're too small it's like that's <laughs> yeah, and that's the, the biggest that's mistake the worst thing you can say like that's yeah, yeah. i mean you're the target because you're, they know you're, that's what you're thinking. And that's what you're saying that you're too small. Yeah. And small businesses, they get so frustrated that their passwords with everything that we do need to change every 90 days. Mm -hmm. And we're like, I get it. You hate having 900,000 passwords, but if we don't do these things, it's so easy for criminals to, to get into your networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I, well, I was going to actually ask you about the security in payments with the, with all this rapid change in technology and, and the fact that more small businesses are getting involved. I mean, is there, are, are, are people more vulnerable now, or do you think that the technology is doing a good job of, of keeping up with the bad guys? Yes and no. I mean, so many business owners have default passwords on their routers and modems. Yeah. So if you're, we, so, we, there are so many fraud attacks that happen because a fraudster is sitting in your parking lot on your guest Wi-Fi because the guest Wi-Fi is the exact same network that the point of sale system's on. Mm -hmm. And they're able to log into everything with default passwords. And then they're, they're stealing all of the data that flows through there. And PCI security for a level four merchant is a joke. It's a self-assessment questionnaire that if you don't answer yes to every single question, you fail. So merchants just answer yes to all of those questions so that they get, you know, quote unquote, PCI compliant, but then they're not actually putting those protections into place within their business. If, so yeah. a lot of it's education. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It really does seem to come down to education. I mean, I've talked to some other guests about security and stuff and, 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 and education and, and just. I don't know, put a little effort in, you know, I feel like, and we're all guilty of it. You know, I've talked about it on this podcast before. We're all guilty of the, you download a new app and you're just like, agree, 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 agree. I want to play this game. Yeah. I want to play this game. You know? <laughs> so it's like, we all do it, but it's like, you know, it's not the smartest thing in the world just to, to sit there and, and agree to share all our data all the time and, and not think about the security aspect of things. Yeah. I mean, the younger generation is definitely more cognizant of it. That's good. It's your your boomer owners and decision makers that if it ain't broke, don't fix it, or <laughs> they've been doing it this way for so long that yep. trying to change their ways is a monumental task. That's and very true. That's the wrong way of thinking, but it's so hard to to resonate with them because oh, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen to me. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's got it's gonna happen to somebody. <laughs> so why not you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you see like future regulations uh, shaping the landscape of payment processing? As as this again with this technological technological sort of revolution we're on, do you think that's gonna make some pretty big changes to the finance to the payments industry? From a regulation standpoint, every single time the the federal government has gotten involved in our industry. They've done it very poorly. I mean, regulated debit is a perfect example of that. They took something that was this and then created that. And that is actually costing merchants more because the small business owner went from call it 85, 95, even so much of like 105 basis points on a debit card, but then it was 10 cents for the transaction. Now, okay, regulated debit's five basis points, but it's 22 cents per transaction. So there was all of these unintended consequences that, that came from that particular regulation. The tech industry, I think, has done a really good job with self-regulation, 
going from SSL to TLS and all of the various different versions of that. The PCI Council, I think, is doing a great job with updating all of the PCI rules and regulations and, and what's compliant. I think that it was moronic of the United States to not do chip and pin like every single other country does in the world. Um, so what the people need to remember a pin for their credit card, it should be chip and pin that would make your point of sale based transactions bulletproof for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that there could be some component of pin based transactions for e-commerce coming out in the future, but that's going to require a lot of software upgrades to all of the payment gateways to be able to have that type of pin encryption embedded into their systems, because that would really eliminate the e-commerce based fraud. Like you would need to know the pin as well as the, the card data. And so there, those types of enhancements I can, I can see coming down, down the roadmap. But when the U S came out with chip cards, I was shocked that they went chip and signature and not chip and pin like every other country. Um, and it also would make table side that much more prevalent. You Maybe. travel anywhere outside of the United States, you're never handing your card to anyone ever. You're always making the payment yourself. No matter if you're at a restaurant, a train station, it doesn't matter. You're putting, you're tapping your card. You're inserting your card. You're then taking your card out. You're never handing it to somebody. But in the U.S., everybody is just like, here you go, waiter. Take my card. Yeah. And they run away okay, for yeah, a while. And they walk and around then, back, yeah. write down my card information, my CVV mm -hmm. code, and everything. It's, it's mind blowing to me that that's how it is in the United States. So I, I hope that that changes. That would be a good regulation in my yeah. opinion. But when the government gets involved in interchange, they do it wrong. Um, and the Durban amendment is, a, is, and which created regulated debit is a perfect example of that. Um, but you know, certain regulations I think are good. Like I said, you know, if they, if they've require pin i mean it's going to reduce so much fraud so i don't know i'm, I'm kind of wishy-washy a Born. little bit on <laughs> on the regulation front just because of bad experiences of you know what's been done so far yeah the pin's an interesting thought i mean i, I guess i didn't really think about that especially think about how many people's stuff gets stolen at gas stations you know they put those yeah. little contraptions in there skimmer and yeah 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 exactly thank you and if there was a pin that would they wouldn't that wouldn't help matter right they wouldn't be able to get the pin from you well, in that, so in that instance, you know, it would, when the skimmers on the gas station pump, if it's a chip card, that card number is unique. All right. Where they're getting the data is the mag stripe. Ah. So why the banks keep the mag stripe on chip cards baffles me. Every single business in America was supposed to have already had chip based technology built in but there are certain you know you go to some gas stations and they still only have the card reader or you yeah, go to sometimes a restaurant I have to pos swipe. and they yeah. have the mag stripe reader yeah that should be that should be completely banned Listen. there should be no more mag stripes printed on any newly issued credit or debit card if they eliminate the mag stripe now the chip is creating a unique card number every single time that's only good for that one transaction at that moment in time you add pin to that, now it's even more secure. Yeah, it yeah. would completely, completely eliminate the effectiveness of skimmers. Interesting. We need to get there. Um, I like to ask this question sometimes, and we talked about it earlier, and I'm curious. So, so I'm guessing you don't think we're moving towards a cashless society, at least not soon. No. Judging by what you said about the ATMs earlier. Not at all, because... In our existing ATM portfolio, the cash is going up on every ATM. The amount yeah. of cash withdrawn on a monthly basis on every single one of our machines is going up every single month. There's real needs for cash, and then there's the illicit needs for cash. You know, people are still going to use cash for, you know, things that are not legal. Sure. But 
there's there's still a prevalence in you know your main street style businesses you know your barber shop you just throw them 20 bucks or 40 bucks you know you don't you don't think about it you just do it mm-hmm. and if you forget cash that day boom well here's an atm for you mm-hmm. and with more and more regional and local banks reimbursing their customers for you know three to six atm withdrawals from a non uh bank ATM that's, you know, part of their network, more and more people are using ATMs outside of their banks. I mean, obviously Bank of America and Wells Fargo aren't, you know, doing those types of reimbursements unless you carry, you know, a really high account balance with them. But there's still that need for cash and especially, you know, cash is king when it comes to tradespeople, you know, and so you're doing home repairs on your house. A bag full of money goes a lot longer than writing them a check for a deck or a bathroom reno or whatever it may be. So there there are still those needs. And then there's the underbanked population or the population that is on some type of supplemented income through the state or federal government. And they're getting their cash benefit on you know the first or fifth of every single month. And then they're going to an ATM to take that cash out. And they don't have a bank that they bank with, right? You know, so there's always going to be a need for cash, and we're only seeing it increase. You know, if that changes, we'll sell the portfolio and get out of the business. But <laughs> for the time being, and for the foreseeable future, right now, I don't see that. And I love crypto. I think crypto is a great thing, and and could you know enable that um, type of cashless society, but I also don't think the federal government wants that either. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Like that, that the federal government probably doesn't want that. Yeah. Well, Keith Reardon, Commonwealth Consulting Group, thanks so much for being here. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Oh, thank you for your time. I hope you have a great one, Kevin.